Good evening, everyone. Ah, you didn't greet me back. God bless you. Always happy to see you here. And I pray that the word of God will impact every one of our lives together in Jesus' name. As the pastor is growing, all the leaders, pastors will be growing along with him too in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the joy of the Lord and his sacrifice that all your people are making to make sure that they are always here. Lord, I pray we will not come in vain in Jesus' name. Bless us together tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're reading from Matthew chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 18 to verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, unto the end, even unto the end of the world. And everybody said, we're looking at those verses tonight, and we're talking about baptism, water baptism. And the topic is scriptural insight into the believer's baptism. Scriptural insight into the believer's baptism. The baptism before, the, before Christ's final atonement were, was different or limited in purpose and significance. As we all know, John the Baptist baptized in water. How did he baptize in water? What name did he use in baptizing in water? What formula did he use? And what understanding did the people have when he baptized them in water? Not only that, the disciples also baptized in water before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What was the concept, the understanding? at that time when those disciples baptized in water and now that jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not shall be damned what were they to believe yes he said go into all the world preach the gospel what gospel what's the difference between the gospel before Jesus died and after Jesus died. What was the gospel before Jesus died? Good news, glad tidings, that Jesus Christ has come and is the power of God, is the Son of God. And they didn't talk much about believing in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. But now, after Jesus rose from the dead, you will see that it was very important, an important integral part of the gospel, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And this is what they were now to believe. Not only that, um, you know, the glad tidings, anyone who comes, he will not reject them. Yes, that's still true. But the gospel in particular, look at First Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. You see, everything is surrounding the gospel there. The gospel that I preached, the gospel that you received, and the gospel wherein you stand. What's that gospel? By which also ye are saved. This gospel, the one we're reading about in verse 1, 
This is the gospel by which you are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. This is the gospel now. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. At the time of John, Christ had not died. All they will believe at the time of John, there's one coming after me. It's mightier than I. It's the Son of God. It's the one that was baptized in the Holy Ghost. John did not emphasize to them, apart from sin, behold the Lamb of God that taketh the sins of the world away. But now the gospel is very clear. After Jesus died, it becomes an integral part of the presentation of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Not only that, and that he was buried. That's the gospel now. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not just saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Christ. I believe that you know, he is my savior. We must emphasize the fact that now the gospel includes the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm coming to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 9. That ye thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The, the gospel is very clear. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and when they presented the gospel, you can check up in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, Peter spoke about the fact that he was killed, he was buried, he rose again, and then he pointed to them and said, you are guilty of crucifying him. And then as we come to all the other presentations of the gospel, in the Acts of the Apostles, the emphasis is very clear, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and now we're reading in Romans, it says, you confess with your mouth and you believe from your heart that God raised Christ up from the dead. He died, he buried, he rose up. And then it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's the gospel that we're preaching. That's the gospel we're emphasizing that they believe and they get saved. If somebody says, I believe Jesus was a great man. I believe Jesus was a great prophet. I believe Jesus was a great teacher. I believe Jesus was the greatest of all the people that ever lived. You cannot baptize him. It's not said that he believes that Jesus died for our sins, for my sins in particular. And he was buried and he rose again for my justification. If there is no clear evidence that he believes on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's not gone far enough. That's the total atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming now to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, we must read from verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them and rebuked them with, because of their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They knew he died, they knew he was buried, and now that he rose from the dead, they have not brought that into their conscious understanding and faith. And he rebuked them because they didn't believe on those who have seen him after he rose from the dead. After he cleared their unbelief, and now they knew the one that died, 
the one that was buried rose again from the dead look at verse 15 now and he said unto them go ye to all the world and preach the gospel this gospel of my death of my burial of my resurrection is rebuked them is taking all that unbelief away they will not preach this gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized he that believeth that gospel of his death his burial his resurrection of the atonement he made for the cleansing removal of our sins he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not I believe the Bible, but I don't want to think about, you know, uh, Jesus rose from the dead. I believe in the morals of the Bible. I believe in the doctrine of the Bible that makes you live upright. I believe in the golden rule, do unto others as so want them to do unto you. I believe that we should live a life that will love everybody and help everybody. I believe we should live a life like the life of Christ and follow after his example. Uh-uh, that's not it. The gospel there to believe is that this is the Lamb of God. He was to go to Calvary and die, and now he's gone, he's dead, and he was buried, and he rose again. That's the gospel, that's the good news. And that through that resurrection, we are now justified. He that does not believe that will be damned. And so, we are talking about scriptural insight into the believer's baptism. Three things we're looking at. Number one, turning and believing before the water baptism. We don't just uh, take all the people that have come to us and go dip them in water. There is turning and believing before the water baptism. Number two, teaching the baptized believers beyond the willing baptism. They're willing to be baptized after they're saved. And here is water. What hinders me, what stops me to be baptized? If you believe with all your heart, that would mean I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe all that you have explained to me from Isaiah chapter 53 that I read, I didn't understand that all my iniquities were laid upon him, is led as a lamb to the slaughter, and eventually he died and was buried and he rose again. Everything you've told me about him, I believe that that Jesus is the Son of God who fulfilled the atonement uh, prophecy that is in Isaiah chapter 53, he was baptized. After that baptism, willing baptism, teaching baptized believers beyond the willing baptism. Point number three, trimming the bride. The bride were babes, were believers, were members of the body of Christ, all together we become the bride, the bride of Christ, trimming the bride. There are edges to cut out. There are some rough uh, things in our lives to, to smooth in. And there are some spots and some stains to remove. We put all that into trimming, trimming the bride through the weightier baptisms. Plural, the weightier baptisms. There are baptisms in the New Testament, weightier than water baptism. And all that the Lord gets us through as leaders, as members of the body of Christ, and as the bride of Christ, He trims us. You must recall in your mind the temple of Solomon and all the stones that will be used in that temple. They had caught everything to size so that when they brought all the stones to the site, there wasn't any knocking of anything or chiseling of anything. They had done all the chiseling. They had done all the cutting. They had done all the measurements before they brought those stones and they just laid them and put them there and then the temple came up. The same thing, the bride of Christ from all over the world 
when the rapture takes place, it's going to take us away as the bride. But that will not be the day when, you know, you are getting sanctified, you are confessing something, you are repenting of something, you are turning around and all that. All the chiseling, all the cleansing, and all the trimming would have been done before that day. That's uh, the reason for this, point number three, the trimming of the bride. Trimming the bride through the weightier baptism, something weightier than water baptism. Something weightier than the initial baptism, the weightier baptism. So let's come back to number one, turning and believing before the water baptism. We're coming to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 19, go ye therefore and teach. And then he says, after that teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Then verse 20, teaching them. You see, there are two, uh, there are two sides of the teaching there. There is the teaching before the water baptism. And then there's the water baptism. After the water baptism, that's teaching now, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded them. This first teaching, that's verse 19, go ye into all the world and teach all nations before the baptism, that's to teach them they need to be saved. It's to teach them they need Christ as Savior. He died for them. They need to know that. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Reading from verse 37. Acts chapter 2. We're reading from verse 37. Uh, the teaching has gone on. Peter the apostle had spoken to the people. He spoke to them about their sin. He spoke to them about their guilt. He spoke to them about the fact that Jesus Christ has died for them. And he was raised again. And now the effect of that teaching to turn and to believe. To turn and to believe. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, now when they heard this, they were preached in their heart. When they heard the words that they were guilty, that they were condemned, and that Jesus Christ now was ready to save them, they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and then be baptized. Repent, there must be a turning force, turning away from all the evil things they had done. Come to verse 14. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Separate yourselves from this untoward generation. Sever yourself, come out from this untoward generation. And then they that gladly received his word, the word of repentance, and the word of faith in Christ, those were the people that were baptized. They gladly received the word before the water baptism. What's the word to repent? What's the word? Save yourself from this unto a generation. And then they were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Then verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. These are saved people. Not people you are running after. And then they are saying, no, I have my own denomination. I belong to the synagogue. I belong to the sanctuary. I belong to, you know, Pharisee so-and-so is my pastor. And um, Sadducee so-and-so is my father in the Lord. Not at all. These people understood the step they were taking. They came out of all that, and it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. What's that to them? In breaking of bread. These people, they didn't know anything about the breaking of bread. All they knew was the Passover, the Passover of the Old Testament. But now they told them, 
that as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is the controller of your life now, is the teacher in your life now, and is the overall director of your life, and he has instituted the breaking of bread. They just said yes to everything because they were converted. They are turned from personal opinion. They are turned from denominational tradition. They turned from everything and they believed. And so whatever they were told that this is what Jesus, the Savior, the Lord wanted, that's what they followed and they continued in our prayers. Chapter 3 of Acts. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore, this is another congregation, the congregation of uh, chapter 2, they are now moving on with the Lord, and uh, Peter the apostle is preaching to another congregation that needed to hear the full gospel of salvation, the gospel of turning away from evil and believing on the only Savior, the only one that can save us. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And ye shall say, Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Look at verse 26, unto you first, God having raised up his son, he brings the resurrection. And before the resurrection, there'll be death. And after that, burial. They must understand, the people hearing must understand, it's not just a kind of a general message, God is good, Jesus is good, he will, you know, help you, he will do whatever you want him to do. If you come to him, he's knocking at the door, and if you open your heart, he will come. They must hear what is the gospel. And they must say that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And so in verse 26, it says unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, look at this, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The turning must take place. It's not just that, okay, I believe now, and I add uh, Jesus to all the ideas I have. No, it's the only Savior. And this is the cornerstone of our salvation. It's the cornerstone of the edifice and the building of the kingdom. It must be very clear that Jesus Christ is Savior. He died for us. He rose again. We're coming to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. What was he teaching? Verse uh, 21, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. If you are not hiding anything at all, that's why he came. He came to die for us, and he came to take away our sins. And the apostle here said, I have not neglected. I have not shunned. I have not been careless. I declared unto you the whole counsel of God. Look at chapter 26 of Acts. Acts chapter 26, we're reading from verse 18. Acts 26, reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, to open their eyes. To open their eyes. It's not just to entertain people. And it's, just not, it's not just to excite people. It's not to tell them stories that will make them happy and make them say, okay, if Jesus is like that, I'm going to receive him. He opened, is to open their eyes and turn them, you see that? And turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God 
those who are serving Satan, having occultism or covenant with Satan, their eyes will be open. That there's no way there. It's the way of damnation. They must understand that Jesus and Jesus alone is the Savior. And he has approved that by dying on the cross, being buried, and then rising again. And their eyes are opened. And it says that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in him, in me. Because Christ was talking, wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to this, to the heavenly vision, but showed forced unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throw out all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Do works meet for repentance. Look at verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue until unto this day, witnessing both to small and great witnessing both to the young and the adults, witnessing to everyone, not keeping back part of the message because, okay, they are small, they are children, they want to understand this. If they want to understand, how are they going to get saved? Because they must understand that Jesus had to die for us and that Jesus had to uh, be buried and had to rise again. Uh, look at it, it says, preaching to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say shall come, that Christ shall suffer. That's the gospel. He said, that's what I'm telling them everywhere. That's what I'm telling them to believe. They turn from their sin and they have to believe that Jesus Christ should suffer and that he should be the force that shall rise from the dead. It's part of the gospel. It's part of the good news. The auto here and should show light to the people and to the Gentiles. And that's what the Lord has now called upon, called us uh, to go and preach and to go and emphasize. We're coming to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and had him reach prophet, the prophet Isaiah's. And said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. That's the death of the Messiah, the Savior that will come. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. He's talking about his betrayal, his trial, and eventually the condemnation. And it says, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. That's the death of Jesus Christ. When Philip prayed to the Enoch of Ethiopia, this is what he explained to him. The man had read that about the death of Christ and about the burial and the resurrection, but he didn't understand. That's why Philip said, do you understand what you are reading? That prophecy? It has been fulfilled, fulfilled on somebody. And do you understand? Then it says, and you can answer Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself, that he will die, and then he will still be alive later, or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. 
He looked at Isaiah chapter 53 with him at the same scripture. He began there and he explained that's prophecy about the Messiah. That's prophecy about Jesus. That's prophecy about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection to prove that he is the only one that can save. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said see here is water what does hinder me to be baptized how did that come in that's part of what philip had said that's what part, part of what philip had opened his eyes to see he spoke about jesus fulfilling prophecy about his death and about his resurrection and after he rose again he sent us to go and preach this gospel to every creature and whosoever believes that will be saved and then he also told us that those who believe will be baptized he had told him everything that's why the question came and he said here is water what does hinder me to be baptized he didn't uh, say, uh, here is a glass of water, can you pour it on me? He didn't say, here is, uh, you know, part of the water I'm uh, drinking, uh, can you make a sign of the cross on me? They came to a river, to a pond, where they can dip him in water, because baptism means immersion. Philip had explained everything, that's why he now said, here is water, what does it mean to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, everything I said, that Jesus came to fulfill prophecy, and that he died, and that he was buried, and that he rose again, and that he says we shall repent, and that you should believe on him, so as to have an everlasting life, if you believe all that with all your heart, then thou mayest, then he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who came to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. Here is going to be a public testimony now. The driver of the chariot and all the others in the chariot, he, didn't, he wasn't ashamed, he wasn't afraid that they would look at him as getting a new kind of religion. But they all waited, and then they went into the river, and when they baptized him in the river, and the eunuch, and, and, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, they had been inside the water, they, they went in. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught him with Philip, and that the eunuch saw him no more. And uh, he went on his way. What was he doing? Rejoicing. Grant unto me the joy of thy salvation. He had the joy of salvation. Point number two now. Teaching the baptized believers beyond their willing baptism. They have now been baptized. The converts have been baptized. And then what follows? We are coming back to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse to, uh, chapter 28, reading from verse 20. Teaching them to observe. Verse 19, uh, there was the teaching that brought them to repentance. The teaching that brought them to turn in. The teaching that brought them to faith in Christ. Faith in the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And then that teaching... Uh, was followed by baptism, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. After that baptism, which they willingly accepted, after that baptism, which they willingly performed and willingly they went into the river and they came up again, after that water baptism that they did willingly, you are now teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you till the end of the world and somebody said amen, amen. now we understand this when he said until the end of the world peter is no more here 
and we're now nearing the end of the world. We are the ministers here now. We are the leaders here now. And we are the pastors here. We are the evangelists here. And Jesus said that this preaching of the gospel and the water baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, one immersion to show the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it says it will continue until the end of the world. So it wasn't only for those first apostles, it's for every one of us now as we preach the gospel. See how they did it in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, after the water baptism, now they will teach the people. They are taught them, that taunched them, that made them to repent, that made them to call upon the Lord. But now, after that water baptism, see the teaching that continued. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 40. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto a generation. And that was uh, for their repentance. That was for their turning. That was for their coming into the kingdom. Then they that gladly received his word. They that gladly received his word. You see, they had had a change of attitude. When they saw them speaking in tongues, they said, what are these people doing? They said they were drunk with wine. All that had changed. They had turned away from mocking. They had turned away from ridiculing the apostles. They now gladly, joyfully, and cheerfully received the word, and they were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They are now baptized. What's going to happen now? There is teaching those baptized believers after and beyond the baptism. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. The teaching continued after the water baptism. We we'll come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, we're reading from verse 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They'll gather together, just like we gather together for a Monday Bible study or for a Thursday revival hour, or for a Sunday combined service, they gather together in the temple. But the teaching then went on in every house, every house. They divided themselves, just like we do for the house fellowship, and then we go to the neighborhoods. All these converts that have come to know the Lord, the teaching must still go on, after their baptism, and that's what they did from house to house. We're coming to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, we're reading from verse 26. Acts 11, reading from verse 26. And when he had found him, that is, Barnabas went for Saul. You'll find that in verse 25. He brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. The church, the members of the church, they have been baptized in water because it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. These were saved people, but then the teaching continued after the baptism. If we have preached salvation and the people have come to know the Lord, that's not enough. We must go ahead teaching after that water baptism. In fact, it says that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples who are being taught and taught and taught 
after their water baptism, they were called Christians. People just looked at them and they said, this one look like Jesus, act like Jesus, behave like Jesus, and they were called Christians. Chapter 15 of Acts, verse 35. Acts chapter 15, verse 35. And Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching, continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. All the church made up of members who have come to know the Lord. They were teaching them continually. And this is what we are called to do. Acts chapter 20. Verses 27 and 28. Acts chapter 20, verses 27 and 28. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, verse 28. Paul the apostle said, I've done it. I preached to the sinners. I told them to repent. Because God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. They have repented and they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them and who rose again for their justification. They have been baptized in water and have taught them, not hiding anything from them. I now pass it on to you. Verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. They are saved. They have been baptized in water. Now feed them. Now preach to them. Make it systematic. Let them grow. It says, you will teach and feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. He brings in again the death of Jesus, he shed his blood, and then he rose again. He's now at the right hand of God Almighty. He purchased the church. Now you must go on teaching them. And let's come to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Why teach them after they are baptized in water? Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. In verse 11, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the saints. We don't leave them alone after they have repented and believed of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come the teaching continues until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ that's when you stop when they get to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that's when the teaching will stop. But the teaching goes on. After they have been baptized in water, you're teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Look at this in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children. When they turned from their sins and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they were babes in Christ, they were children. But they shouldn't remain children. They should go on unto maturity. That's why it says the teaching continues until we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Colossians chapter 1. The pursuit, the purpose, the program of the teaching after water baptism. We come to Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 28. It says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man. 
warning every man and teaching every man. The teaching is uh, not just, okay, I've done my duty. We make sure that all these converts, all the people who have come to know the Lord, they receive the appropriate teaching. It says, warning and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. And so the teaching continues until they are presented perfect before the Lord. Point number one, turning and believing before the water baptism. Point number two, teaching baptized believers beyond the willing baptism. Point number three now, trimming the bride through the weightier baptisms. Trimming the bride through the weightier baptisms. You'll see that the word baptism here is in the plural, the weightier baptisms. We come to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, plural. Of the doctrine of baptisms. So, there's more than one baptism. And after we're baptized in water, and then we go on in the teaching of the church, there are weightier baptisms we need to talk about. Number one of them, baptism for the saints. Baptism for the saints. Number two, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the Spirit. Baptism in the Spirit. Number three, baptism into total surrender. Baptism, immersion, into total surrender. Number one, baptism for the saints. We're coming to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, I read from verse 49. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. This after John's baptism, fulfilling all righteousness. This after he went into Jordan and was baptized of John. And this after the voice of the Father came from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. After that baptism, Christ said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I stretching till it be accomplished? Wasn't accomplished yet. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division is going to explain for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided three against two and two against three the father shall be divided against the son and because of that division because the son has come to receive the lord as his personal savior and is come into the kingdom of God. And the father is still in the kingdom of darkness. And the father cannot understand. And so he immerses his own child in suffering and persecution. And that is what Jesus was talking about. Persecution will come. Trial will come. It will be like a persecution of fire. It's like somebody is immersed into that fiery a baptism, fiery persecution, because it says also that the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, and the mother-in-law against the against her daughter-in-law, and he, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. I want you to remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
that they were immersed. Baptism means immersion. Baptism means to dip an object inside a particular liquid and the fire was there, furnace of fire, persecution came. Who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? And they were immersed into that fire. And when persecution comes, it burns like fire. And it is for the saints is to purify us. Let's come to Mark chapter 10, the baptism of suffering, the baptism of persecution, the baptism of trial. In uh, Mark chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 32. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. And they, chapter 10, verse 32, and they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Remember what he said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how straightened I am to accomplish that baptism. He says, As the wage, the Son of Man shall be delivered into the unto the uh, chief uh, priest and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him unto the gentiles and they to, and they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him and the third day what will happen I said the third day what will happen? He shall rise again. And James and John, sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, what uh, we would that thou shouldest do for us, whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do unto you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Listen to this. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. This is not the baptism in the Holy Ghost. This is the baptism of suffering. Already he told them, we're going to Jerusalem, and this will happen to me. And that is the baptism I'll be immersed in. And then I'll pass from there. I would have fulfilled totally, entirely, completely, all righteousness demanded by the Father. And I will go to my throne. I will sit on the throne. And James and John said, we would like to sit with you on the throne. One on this side and one on the other side. And Jesus said, you don't know the price to pay for that. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And can you be baptized? With the baptism, I'm going to be baptized with. And they said, yes, Lord, we can. Yes, Lord, we will. Would you remember the first apostle to die? That's James. That's the, that's the fire of a suffering. And that's the persecution. That's the baptism that he said he was willing to. And history tells us that they put John in a boiling pot of oil. Even though he will not die, the persecution was there. And John said, I'm writing to you, the church, seven churches of Asia Minor, a companion of the suffering, persecution of the saints. And so they went through that. That's why it says in First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 7, it says in verse 7 that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold 
that perishes though it be tried with fire you immerse the gold into the fire to melt the gold and to take the oil and the uh, and the stains or whatever out of that gold until the person refining the gold will see his picture on the gold on the stove and then he'll bring the gold out it says that it be tried with fire might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ of Jesus Christ whom have you not seen yet ye love in whom do now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls but the lord has assured us he will not allow us to have persecution or temptation or trial or trouble more than we can bear his grace is sufficient for every one of us and his grace will be sufficient for you in jesus name number one baptism for the saints persecution that's kind of baptism that refines us purifies us purges us number two baptism in the spirit baptism in the spirit we're coming to matthew chapter 3 and verse 11 matthew chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 11 in matthew chapter 3 verse 11 the baptism in the spirit i indeed baptize so with water unto repentance but there comes after me one that is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Already we know about that, you will receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and to the utmost part of the earth. And our leaders say, yeah. number three, baptism, which is immersion in total surrender. Immersion in total surrender. Come to First Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're reading from verse 13. In verse 13, for by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body? This one is not water baptism. This one by the Spirit. You know, water baptism is not done by the Spirit, it's done by the preacher, it's done by the evangelist, it's done by the minister. And uh, the Holy Ghost baptism is done by Jesus Christ. There is one mightier than I, whose shoes lashed I'm not able to bear. He, Christ, the Savior, the Sanctifier, will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. But now look at this. For by one Spirit, not by man, not by Christ, by one Spirit, are we all baptized immersed into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be born or free and have been made to drink into one spirit with this baptism into the body or this immersion which is for absolute surrender the hand cannot say to the feet i have no need of you the eyes cannot say to the ears i have no need of you neither can the head say to the feet you are not part of the body there is no total unity and there is surrenderedness because of this kind of a baptism that he mercies us into the body look at verse 18 but now as god said the members everyone immersed into the body and we are satisfied and we're submissive and we surrender because now god has set members every one of them in the body as it has pleased him the question is have you been baptized since you believed 
Number one, have you been baptized in water? Not only that, have you been baptized since you believe? Have you been baptized in the normal persecution that comes to every believer? And did you submit to that? Were you immersed in it when the things came upon you and overwhelmed you and overshadowed you? Did it refine you? Have you been baptized in the Spirit since you believe? The opportunity is there. The power is available. And if you will come, it will baptize you. But you know, uh, in Romans, we are told that we are buried by baptism. Have you been buried since you believed? Have you been buried with Christ? Have you identified with Christ? All the past, all the, you know, I am this, I am that, and the natural pride of the human soul, has that been buried? Since you believed, have you been bound to him? Have you been bound to Christ since you believe? You see, when we are baptized, we are now identified with him. We are bound with him and the life which I now live. I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Have you been baptized since you believed? Have you been buried since you believed? Has pride been buried since you believed? Have you been bound to him since you believed? Have you been broken since you believed? That you know, all the things you used to brag about, you know, I am this, I am that. Have you died to that? Have you been buried? Are you now seeing that everything you have and all you can ever be is in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been broken? Your will has it been broken? Your backbone has it been broken? And the human pride has it been broken? Have you been so broken that all you can do you now is by the grace of God, the natural strength and natural power, all that is gone, but now you are baptized, you are baptized, and you are buried with him, and you are bound to him, and you are broken. Have you been branded since you believe? You see, when we become children of God, and we turn away from who we were, and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ now, and we become a servant, we are branded by him. You see all those hurts men uh, that are having their hearts and their cattle, they branch them and they write a sign on them so that no other shepherd and no other hurts men will be able to say, that is mine, that's my brand, that's my brand. And Paul the apostle says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been that branded that Satan will see you and see that brand, it belongs to God? And the demons will see you and say, she belongs to God. And all the parts of darkness in their eyes to see spiritually, they will know that you are branded. Have you been bought in the ear? The servant will be brought to the side post and then to say that I am a servant. I mean, absolute surrender, total surrender unto the Lord. He brings the master, brings him to the side of the doorpost, and he drill a hole in the ear, not for ornament and not for fashion, but to show that that is my servant. Has your ear been bought since you believe? Have you been burdened since you believe that the same body that Jesus carries is what you carry? And the same passion that Jesus has is what you have? Are you buried with him? Are you identified with him? Are you really baptized into the grave, into the burial? like him have you been burdened like him have you been bridled since you believe you see there are people they do not understand now my mouth belongs to the lord my tongue belongs to the lord my life belongs to the lord and now i am bridled for him and only when he wants me to talk do i talk only what he wants me to say do i say have you been bridled by him and for him since you believed the lord can take us today and immerse us into himself and cover us completely by himself so that you are dead and your life is hid with christ in god and satan will not see you anymore enemies will not see you anymore and all these parts of darkness will not see you anymore 
you can be buried with him today and you can be baptized by him today and you can be uh, you can be branded by him today you can be broken by him today your ear can be bored and drilled through today you can be bound to him today boarding like him today and the lord can reproduce himself in your life and in your ministry and it can start tonight i said it can start tonight baptized in the spirit baptized through with the seas and baptized in absolute surrender let's rise up and call upon the lord and be totally immersed in christ immersed in christ immersed in christ that we're not struggling anymore we're totally totally completely in christ the lord will do it in our lives in every one of our lives and the lord will make use of us more as we are baptized with him and in him and we're buried with him in jesus name